discussion, we will look at the African mining vision as it relates to small-scale mining. We will consider some of the events leading to the ban on small-scale mining in Ghana. We will consider the improvements in ASM gold extraction technology, and we will pull out some issues from the Interministerial Committee on ASM, their roadmap that is being used now. The African mining vision places a lot of emphasis on small-scale mining. It's the fact that the national value addition from small-scale mining is far bigger than the enclave type of mining from these large-scale mines. Because the money that is generated in small-scale mining is always spent locally. So it contributes directly to national value addition. If you generate the money in, say, Dunkwao, if you don't spend the money in Dunkwa, you will spend it in Kumase. If not in Kumase, at least it will be spent in Accra. So eventually the money sticks. But for large scale mines, most of the money virtually goes back to where the investment came from. So the African mining vision talks about sector linkages in the small scale mining sector, where we would look at exploration, mining, mineral processing, smelting, and other forms of fabrication to create more wealth in the sector. So for instance, a small scale miner may get five kilograms of gold at the end of the month if it's a very good month. These five kilos he will sell at the national, I mean the world level of metal prices. But assuming he divides this into two and gives half of these five kilos to somebody who is, a, who is into minerals and fabrication, like a goldsmith. The goldsmith can create about 10 times the value of the 2.5 kilos given to him when compared to the one that he sold directly. So the system is talking about development of a small scale mine that cuts across several fields. For instance, we are looking at people using equipment, the famous chamfan that we all talk about. The chamfan has got several parts. It has got its shell, it has got its screen, it has got um, the hammers that are running. The question is, should we always import all these parts into Ghana? Is it not possible that we can set up one little company just to produce the hammers of the chamfan? Another company producing the screens of the chamfan. Another company possibly producing the body. So that if we cannot even develop the motor here, at least we can buy the motor and then assemble the other parts here, thereby creating forward linkages, backward linkages to the small scale mining sector. The government talks about one district, one factory, and I dare say that we can create almost about 80 factories out of small scale mining if we are serious. The gold belt of Ghana cut across 80 districts and municipalities in Ghana. And if we are serious minded, we can create 80 small scale mines in these municipalities and districts that we are talking about. In addition to the several other um, backward and forward linkages that we are talking about. We talk about investment in small scale mining and this is what has brought about this Chinese issue that we are all talking about. The issue is, is it not possible for us to develop a small scale mining bank? The, Government or the Minerals Commission talks about 1 million small-scale miners in Ghana. Assuming each small-scale miner pays 1,000 Ghana, how much is that? How much do we need to set up a bank in Ghana here? Small-scale miners, these 1 million people, can put together 2,000 Ghana each and we can set up a small-scale mining bank. The advantage of setting a bank like that is the fact that if you go to, let's say, Commercial Bank or Fidelity to take a loan, if you take it in February, you start paying in March. If you take it in September, you start paying in October. The question is, if somebody takes a loan to do small-scale mining, the next month, he wouldn't have even hit the ground. And therefore, taking a loan from the standard banks around us to go into small-scale mining will always let you lose. And that is why these banks cannot support small-scale mining. 
And therefore, as we sit down and think through some of these things, these are issues that should engage us. Value addition into jewelry, backward linkages into development of some parts of the equipment that they use, the establishment of a small-scale bank, safety equipment, shovels, even food. We all chew um, chicken, and small-scale miners chew a lot of chicken. One million of them. They all chew. Before the chicken gets to Ghana, perhaps it would have stayed in um, a grocery shop in the um, US for six months and it's not ready for sale. They put it on a ship for another two months, it gets to Ghana, it spends another one week at the port before it gets to your shop in um, Dungwao and you buy it. But if we are able to develop the linkages, perhaps we can get about 20 poultry farmers working to feed small scale miners. And that would create so many linkages around us and so many industries. The African mining vision wants to look at the effect of the resource case in Ghana so that we will not continue to send all the money that is generated in our industries outside. Look at the tale of two cities. One is Johannesburg, one is Pristia. Mining has gone on in these two towns for almost the same number of years. What do we see now? If you go to Pristia and you are driving, you dodge one portal, you get two free. <laughs> you dodge one portal, you get two free. Go to Johannesburg. The place is different. Why? Because in Johannesburg, the money that was used in building the city was generated in the city. The money that was used in mining was generated in the community. And therefore, when the money was obtained, it was spent in the community. That is why it is important for us to generate the money that is used for small-scale mining in Ghana, so that when we get the money, we can spend it in Ghana. And that is the reason why if you see small-scale miners always bringing in Chinese and other foreigners to do small-scale mining, it is not good enough. The small-scale miners who are here. It is important for us to build a system that is robust enough to sustain the small-scale mining industry in Ghana. Because if the little money that we are supposed to use in developing our communities is also being taken away by other people, then what else do we have to use to build our communities? Let us avoid the resource case and reverse it so that one day Pristia can, if not even become like Johannesburg, at least like Accra. And that will be very useful. Talking about the small scale mining environment, it is the favorable geological environment in Ghana that propels small scale mining. Um, the gold belt is all around us, as I said. There are so many gold belts, according to the geologists, and they cut across 80 districts in Ghana. That means that if we put our act together, we can get about 80 standard small-scale mines in Ghana, large enough to accommodate many of the youth in the communities that are not working. We have all witnessed the trend of gold production in small-scale mining, starting from about 2.2% of total gold value in 1989 to a high of 34% in 2015, just before the ban was placed. It dropped to 31 in 2016, not because production in small-scale mining went down, but because another large-scale miner, Sanko, came on board, and therefore gold production became big, and then the small-scale mining production dropped by 3%. It means that small-scale mining is contributing immensely to gold um, production and national development as a whole. If you have one million people working in a field, according to World Bank standards, it means that each person is able to touch about six other people. And that means small-scale mining, in actual fact, was taking care of six million Ghanaians. And that is 20% of our population. There is no single sector that takes care of 20% of Ghana's population. And therefore, small-scale mining is really at the center of um, national value addition and national development. And all of us should be able to contribute to sustain that sector we call small-scale mining. At the moment, we are all aware of the ban. And some events led to the ban. And indeed, 
somebody had to take that decision because there was excessive land degradation based on the activities of small scale miners wild search for mineralized land water pollution i don't know whether anybody who is a small scale miner has a concession on a river and if nobody has a concession on a river then why is this going on here well i can't swim but we have a navy and the navy's duty is not to wear their white and stay in the barracks one of their duties is to go on the seas and the rivers in Ghana to make sure that there is sanity there. And therefore, in as much as we blame the small scale miners for building rafts and destroying our waters, we should also put the blame also on our officials who are supposed to take care of our rivers. Because a typical um, person from Minerals Commission cannot swim on this river to go and stop a small scale miner. But there are people who have been trained to do that. So the bad safety records, the water pollution, and all these things made it difficult to differentiate between what was legal and what was illegal. People say that small scale miners, some of them had legal access to the land. And therefore, it was wrong for the government to put a ban on small scale mining activities. But even those who had legal access to the land, were bringing on board foreigners. They cannot deny it. Some of them are here. And since small scale mining was for Ghanaians, and legal small scale miners were bringing in foreigners, it means indirectly they were also illegal. And therefore, somebody had to take a decision to stop the rot. And it is good that the president of the nation said, no, enough is enough. Let us sit down, reorganize, and go back. If you look at a figure like this, this is a typical small scale mine in Ghana. Let's be honest with ourselves. Is this mining? There are so many mining engineers here. Is this real mining? Fetching the soil and putting it on the incline that you are working on. In case it rains, what will happen here? And I ask again this question that if you have a child at home and you buy a bicycle for that child and every day he comes back home hurt because he couldn't drive the bike, ride the bicycle, well, what will you do? Somebody says, oh, we will take the bicycle and sell it. We will do this. And I said, well, then the government has taken your bicycle. <laughs> but the government will not sell it. He will teach you how to use the bicycle. And after you've learned how to use it, he will give it back to you. So this break in your activities is a learning process for all of you so that when you know how to ride your bicycle, it will be given back to you and then you go ahead. This is another one. Steep slopes. And how they assess the pits is dangerous. They go down there with a rope and they bring out their oil with a rope. Can any responsible person look on unconcern for this one to go on? The answer is clear. So somebody had to take a decision to stop small-scale mining. Again, I talked about the fact that nobody has a concession on a river. So if you see people working on rivers, it means that definitely there's an illegality there. And somebody had to take a decision. Now the ban has been on for almost a year. People are crying, people are shouting, and very soon I believe that the roadmap will come to an end for small-scale mining activities to be resumed. I'm hoping that either later this month or early next month an announcement will be made because the interministerial committee is working very hard. Now, what do we do to develop a sustainable ASM sector in Ghana? Education, education, education. Then later we can talk about enforcement and then sanctions. In which direction should education go? We are talking about prospecting, exploration, blasting. The inspectorate division is here. Normally, they do not issue blasting certificates to people unless it is a mine that has brought them for certification. But I'm hoping that very soon they will revise some of the things they do 
so that small scale miners trained at UMAT can be brought for certification. So that in every district in Ghana where there is small scale mining, we will have certified blasters amongst them who can blast according to the laid down principles so that nobody gets hit. Because whether we like it or not, small scale miners are blasting. And the law allows them to blast. But then the inspectorate division doesn't issue licenses unless they are coming from a mine. So we all should be able to think about it and say that, look, in every district, let us train about 10 blasters for small scale mines so that these people would go from one concession to the other, blast for a fee and bring some sanity in that area. We will also talk about resource optimization, the use of mercury and non-mercury processes, and then tailings disposal, not just throwing away stuff. The Interministerial Committee is doing something now which we call model mines. I'll talk about it. And I'll also talk about something I'm dreaming about, which I call the quadrant mining system. We are talking about the fact that um, cocoa production has gone down, and therefore small-scale miners should not be allowed to buy cocoa farms. The question is, you take this decision in Accra, but who will enforce it at Botiboni? These are the issues on the ground. Botiboni, you don't, do, who is here who knows where Botiboni is? And if somebody there wants to sell his cocoa farm, how can you prevent that when you are sitting in Accra? So it is important for us to get each, um, laws and mechanisms on the ground that will help in some of these things so that we can mine without necessarily losing the cocoa issues. Now let us talk about some of the technological advancements in the field. The first thing I want to look at is liberation. Small scale miners normally use the chamfa and then the disc mill, um, which is locally using grinding corn that we call the corn mill. The chamfa would normally grind and release particles of size 80% passing one millimeter. While the disc mill would also grind and release particles 80% passing 4 to 5 microns. The question is, what is the particle size of the gold itself? So if somebody who is using the chamfan grinds to 1 mm and thinks that he can get the gold, what is the particle size of the gold? Gold, as we know, can be as fine as 1 micron. Of course, that doesn't mean they should grind to 1 micron. But if you are doing gravity concentration, then you should know that gra standard gravity concentration equipment can pick particles up to about 40 microns. So the sluice board and the pan and all those kind of equipment that small scale miners use, at least so long as it's around 40, 20 microns, it can pick it. So if you grind to one mm and you think that you are liberating the gold, you are just, um, you know, that is why we say that small scale miners normally pick only gravity recoverable gold and leave a good percentage of the gold in the tailings. And many large scale mines are taking advantage of that. It is not every problem that is spiritual are the small scale miners here. Research by one small scale miner who did his masters in UMAT. Collins, I, um, Kusi, are you there? <laughs> Kusi is a small scale miner who came to do masters in, in my department. And his research indicates that the typical Chinese mat cannot catch small particles. Any particle below about 100 microns will not be caught by the Chinese mat. So if you build your sleeves and you line it from head to toe with Chinese mat, you are catching only nuggets. All the rest go to tails. And that means when you are building your sleeves board, it is important to start with a portion, you have your Chinese mat, then you can follow it up with some corduroy material and possibly some blanket, so that the three together can catch the course, the middle, and the fronts. If you don't do that, it means that virtually most of the gold that you have milled are being washed to tails whilst only the nuggets are being caught. So it means that in small scale mining operations, if you want to improve upon um, the gravity concentration processes, it is not only about the Chinese mat. 
it is also about the blanket and also about the corduroy material because these will catch the coarse, the middlings, and then the fine material. At the moment, Ghana has signed onto the Minamata Convention on Mercury. And that means we all have to take steps to help reduce mercury usage and mercury emissions in small scale mining operations. Mercury is lost through spillage during amalgamation, poor amalgam distillation, and um, so many other processes. And there's the need for mercury free technologies and also metals that capture mercury after it has been used. How do small scale miners use the mercury? As we know, they do the normal roughing operation on the sluice board, they take the sluice concentrate and they do panning. And after they get the panned concentrate, that they, what they call the kaji or the video, then they will drop the mercury in it and rub it so that the mercury and the gold can make contact to form the amalgam. The rubbing of the concentrate and the mercury together has the potential to force mercury into the body of the miner because mercury can pass through your skin into your bloodstream. So it means that this is a very dangerous activity, though they do it easily. And here too, you cannot wear gloves because the gloves will just rub against the sand and it will break apart. What can we do then? At the end of the day, they get their amalgam and they handle it. Some of them even can suck the mercury with their mouth and get it out. It is important for us to get a very simple technology that prevents the small scale miner from coming into contact with the mercury. What do we do? Very simple. Get yourself a bottle. Get yourself a funnel. When you get the final concentrate, pass it from your sample tie into the bottle. Add your mercury into the bottle, cock it up, shake it between three and five minutes. After that, discharge it onto the sample tie. Amalgamation is complete. No contact with mercury. This is something that we have been talking with the small scale miners about. That this small bottle, which can be any bottle at all, can help you to do your amalgamation without you coming into direct contact with the mercury. Again, after, the getting, after getting the amalgam, you have to get your sponge gold out. And people would put the amalgam on hot coals and blow air across from their mouth. And as the mercury fumes are coming out, they'll be inhaling it directly. Once I had a chance of engaging a small scale miner and I asked him, so why can't you stop this and then do something else? instead of inhaling mercury every time. His question was, if I continue using mercury, how long will it take me for me to die? I said, well, mercury is not an acute poison. It's not like cyanide. You can be around for the next maybe five to 10 years. He said, oh, if I can spend the remaining 10 years of my life alive, then I'm okay. Even my father would, he didn't reach that age. <laughs> so psychologically, we have to work on them. The education should go from technical to psychological. Our anthropologists here, maybe we have to engage them yeah, as part of the education. So the mercury fumes come out at various stages, either through the open burning or also through um, the smelting operation that takes place later. A study was done in a village called Dumasi, and people were brought on board some male, some female, some galamse, some non galamse And samples, biological samples were taken to assess the impact of mercury on the public health of the people in that village. And it came out clearly that the females were more attacked by the mercury than the males. And the female galamseyers were hit harder than the male galamseyers. And the reason is simple. Mercury normally gets into the body and binds with fatty bodies in the human system. So when I inhale mercury and a female inhales mercury, the impact on the female body is much higher. And it means that the ladies, women in mining, if they are here, should be able to protect their ladies a bit more. When mercury was taken from biological samples, blood, urine, hair, nails, 
um, it came out clearly that for blood, the health standard was 25, but some were reading 96. Urine, the health standard was 50, some were reading 252.9. Um, if you take a sample of your hair and we digest it, the mercury in your bloodstream at the time when the hair was forming would register there. And though the standard was 10, some were reading about 44.6. So it came out clearly that mercury was having a major impact on the public health of the people. The next stage was that um, we have to find ways of reducing mercury. And therefore, some red talks came on board the opaque one and the transparent one. Small scale miners didn't use the opaque one because they could not see into that bottle to see what was going on there. Then Unido introduced the glass retort and they were not using it mainly because according to them, the glass was too fragile and it takes a long time for the heating to be done. So they wanted something that they could see through and also very fast. So based on this concept, I developed what I call the lantern retort which combines the fast heating kinetics of steel and the seat. You heat it for about 30 minutes and um, you can pour your melt, allow it to cool, crack up the glass, and then your gold comes out directly in one step. This is a non-mercury process that is being introduced into the small-scale mining system now. Another thing that has caught attention is the way small-scale miners use water. Many of them wash directly into streams, and that one is not good enough. What at the moment we are introducing is a three-stage pond technique, where before the small-scale miner starts working, you get your machine, dig three ponds, link them up with gutters, and then you, if you are using a trommel or a sluice board, you wash into the first pond. The material will settle, but the water will flow on to the second one. Further, particles will settle before it gets to the third pond. So by the time it gets to the third pond, it's already clean. And the water has been recycled for you to use. So when you have river Pra or river Densu by you, you have no link with that river. The only thing you do is to pump some water from that river into your pond, the pond three. And once you start your operations, the river can be on the side but you don't have any direct link with it. If they are able to do this, then they can recirculate the water all along. With time, pond one will get filled up. You get your excavator, you take the material out and you start using it. If maybe you are working in a place where the oil is very lactritic, naturally when it is moving from pond two to pond three, it may not be clean enough. Get alum in a fertilizer sack, put it in the gutter so that as it passes over the alum, it will become clearer before it gets to the third point. This, we believe, can be used with minimum um, expertise, and every small-scale miner should be able to do this. My last point has to do with the roadmap that has been rolled out by the Interministerial Committee, the IMC. One of the key issues that they are doing, which I have their permission to talk about, is the development of model mines. I talked about the fact that um, the gold belts in Ghana cut across 80 municipalities and we have eight small-scale mining districts in Ghana. So the idea is to get a model mine in each of the small-scale mining districts where the right thing will be done. Exploration, proper mining, resource optimization through extraction, proper tailings disposal. And anybody who wants to mine in that district can go for training at the model mine center before you are allowed to continue with your work. And in that model mine, it will be coupled to a leaching center. And in that leaching center, people in the area can bring their tailings to that facility for leaching so that the resource will be optimized. Because though some large scale mines buy small scale mining tailings, you cannot carry tailings from Botiboni to um, Perseus for leaching. It will make the process not economical. But if there's a smaller facility close to you, you can optimize the resource usage and it will be better. Again, the last thing, I'm dreaming about a quadrant mining system. We always complain that cocoa production is going down because small-scale miners are buying cocoa farms. 
Now, it is not everything that you can get through legislation. If you sit in a cry and you legislate, nobody should sell his cocoa farm to a small scale miner. The question is, how do you enforce that at Botiboni? But one thing we can all do is that we develop a quadrant mining system that if you buy somebody's cocoa farm, zone it into four. Start mining in the first quadrant. Once you exhaust the first quadrant and you start mining the second quadrant, recover the, second, the first quadrant and start planting your seedlings. By the time you finish your second quadrant, the material here would have come up a little bit. By the time you get to the third quadrant, the first quadrant would have lifted up a little bit, you would have reclaimed the second quadrant, and then you mine the third. By the time you get to the fourth, the first material would have started fruiting. Because now we have small, we have cocoa trees that grow within three years in the fruit. So if we are able to adopt this quadrant system, we can still have our mining and still have our cocoa farms. And I'm hoping that um, we can get some research funds to actually try it on the ground. We buy somebody's cocoa farm, we get miners to go and mine it and practice this quadrant system and see what happens after the mining cycle has come to completion. I believe that we can do these things, small scale mining will change. And we are producing a lot of um, intelligent young guys in the university. And if they get to the field and the small scale miners work with them, at the end of the day, we will have a whole revolution in the small scale mining sector and we all will be proud about that. Thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Thanks. It's great. My concern though is one, I have two concerns. One is management of topsoil. Even your last point with respect to um, the Global Farm issue. I've realized that um, with my few individual visitation of, on some few uh, small scale mines, they have no idea that they the need to manage topsoil. So you may recover the land, fill it, but you may not use it for anything profitable. Um, my second point is all these brilliant ideas, all these wonderful ideas, how will all these innovation, all these uh, technology and ideas be implemented with the little human resource of greenhouse pollution? We can't employ numbers enough to monitor all these activities across the country. So in my mind, I think we should do, if the farmers will say shifting conservation, where we restrict mining to a particular area where we can have control over the miners. Then when you realize that they've mined enough and there is no resource which their technology can mine, then we can move them to another area. Rather than opening up the whole country, making it difficult for the minerals commission officer to monitor the mine nuts, but the uh, mine nuts, but what you want. Thank you very much. The first one has to do with um, how do we manage the topsoil that they take off before they start mining. Um, at the moment, small scale miners have a lot of knowledge. Indeed, UMAT has trained 4,000 small scale miners um, with funding from the government of Ghana. And therefore, the small scale miner today is different from the small scale miner of yesterday and they know how to manage topsoil, so long as they are ready to do the right thing. So that one can be managed. And there was this other question about how to monitor to make sure that they are doing the right thing, looking at the um, low numbers of the officers from Minerals Commission. You have a strong point there. I don't think Minerals Commission can employ so many people that every small scale miner will have an officer from the Minerals Commission looking over his shoulder. But I'm also happy about what WAM is doing. I'm getting the engineers available to help and to supervise. I think maybe as WAM rolls out the laws and the ethics of the unit, we will all get to a point where we will know that, as is practice in Canada, if you are an engineer, and you see somebody doing, or doing some activity, and you know that it can lead to harm, and you do not correct it. If that thing happens, your license will be withdrawn. 
it means that you are irresponsible. So if one comes out with the uh, ethics, all of us will be duty bound to make sure that we don't look on unconcerned for people to kill themselves and harm the environment around them. I think that gradually we will get there. But certainly, there is no way that we can employ enough people at Minerals Commission to make sure that at any point in time where mining is taking place, there will be an officer there. I want to believe that the leaders of the Small Scale Miners Association who are here, they should be able to help with the education of their own people to make sure that something goes on well. I'm talking about who develops the communities, the tale of the two mining communities, Johannesburg and Pristia. Yes, small miners pay their tax to the government and they pay royalties in addition. Um, unfortunately, being able to influence government policy is a difficult thing, especially when you are taking money out of the government and giving it to somebody else. But what I believe is that if the small scale mining that is going on in the communities is such that the money is channeled to the development of the communities, we will make a lot of impact. Because if you look at towns like Japa and Wasel Kropong and all those places, as you drive through, you realize that these towns are developing not because of royalties from government, but because of the fact that small-scale miners in those communities are using the money that they are getting to develop the communities. This issue about how royalties should be used has been debated for a long time. And um, I don't want to advance it further. Because government is supposed to return part of the royalties to the community. Normally, the government returns that money to the community almost about two years after it has been paid. Because it goes into a consolidated fund before the auditor general and the accountant general will do their co meanings all round, 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 before later part comes to the assembly and the chiefs get their percentage that they use in buying umbrellas and big... Uh, sandals for occasions but the real community doesn't get much but i believe that we can take advantage of small scale mining to develop some of our communities because as we said earlier the national value addition from small scale mining is much much higher than the enclave type of mining